Remember last week that we said that we serve a generous God and God has chosen to express his generosity through you. God could could display his generosity any way he wanted to, but in his sovereignty, he chose you and I to be part of the process. So what just happened here this Christmas is that God wanted to extend his generosity to children and families in Christmas, so he tapped Miss Cindy on the shoulder, and she and her team said, yes, I will be part of the process to display your generosity and kindness to these people. And then she brought it to us, and you guys partnered with God and with her. And at the end of the day, families were blessed. The kingdom of God expands. The renown of God and his goodness passes forth. And it's because God has chosen to put you and I in the process of him reaching people. It's beautiful. I love being a part of this. And so we said last week, a generous spirit, part of the, the, the benefits of a generous spirit is that it helps us, when we have a generous spirit, it helps us represent the generosity of our Father. But I said something else, another benefit from uh, having a generous spirit is that actually there's blessings attached toward the giver who has a generous spirit. And so this morning, I want to go a little deeper into that, and I want to talk to you about the personal benefit you and I get from expressing generosity and and from being a giver. So we're going to talk about the blessings. Remember, Jesus said that it's more blessed to give than receive, right? And so when we give, there's blessings attached to it. I want to unpack some of those blessings to encourage us to continue in this spirit of generosity. But I need to kind of lay a foundation before I talk about this subject, there's a few things that you need to know. And here's the first thing you need to know is that the kingdom of God functions different from the rest of the systems of the world. Can I hear an amen? The kingdom of God just doesn't function like the rest of the world. In fact, it's been referred to as the upside down kingdom. Kingdom of God just doesn't make sense. It doesn't flow like the rest of the world. Remember when Jesus said, that if you want to be first, okay, so in the kingdom, if you want to be first, there's a way to do it. Well, we know how being first happens in, in, in the systems of this world. To be first, you need to be the best. You need to be the brightest. You need to, be, uh, you need to be, have, have the most energy. And hey, listen to this. If you don't have that, you can at least throw an elbow or two, right, <laughs> to get first, That's how the systems of this world works. If you're first, you may have to step on somebody to get ahead of them. That's the systems of this world. But the kingdom of God doesn't function like that. It's an upside down kingdom. Jesus said, if you want to be first, put yourself last. That's how the kingdom operates. In this world, if you want to be the greatest, if you want to be the greatest of all, then, then again, what you do is you, you, you display your skill set. You do all this. Jesus said, if you want to be greatest in my kingdom, then serve the least. Walk with the spirit of humility and giving. Say amen if you understand it's an upside-down kingdom. It just functions differently. So when we talk about generosity, the subject we're going to be talking about today, I want to talk about it through a kingdom paradigm, not the paradigms of this world. One more thing you need to know is that in the kingdom of God, we walk by faith. See, faith is a vital part of the Christian walk. Many of us don't understand what that means, but we walk by faith. The Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. The Bible says things like Hebrews 11.1. 1, it says, now faith is the, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. What does that mean? It means there are things that I'm hoping and believing for, and I don't have them yet. I don't currently possess them, but I do have a substance to hold on to while I'm believing for what God has told me I could believe for. What is that substance? It's my faith. Faith is what I hold on to. Faith is evidence of something that I don't yet see. I don't yet see it in my life, but I have faith, and that's the evidence that I hold on to. The kingdom of God works through faith. And here's what I believe the most simple Jody definition for faith is. Faith is taking God at his word even when it defies logic. 
Faith is taking God at his word. God, you said, you said that I could stand for my children and and that the, the faith that I possess would pass on into the generations. That's what you said, God. Are there any parents in the house? And there are times when you look with your eyes and it looks like anything but my children are going after God. I was that kid. I had a a mom and dad who believed and prayed and stood when it didn't look right, but they didn't let their eye offend them. And so it didn't matter what I was doing. They were believing. So faith is grabbing hold of that and say, listen, I don't care what I see. I don't care what I feel. I don't care what it looks like or, or, or what the statistics are. My God said... And so if we're going to walk in anything in the kingdom of God, we need to understand that the kingdom doesn't function like the rest of the world and that it's going to take faith. And so here's what I want to do this morning. We're speaking on the topic of generosity and, and the outcome of this, the, the win would be that every one of us leave here today with more of a generous spirit. And so that, that's, what, that's what we're moving toward but you're going to have to have, you're going to have to put faith, exercise your faith in the things that I'm about to show you here. So I would, you know, the tendency is, okay, well, let me muster up some faith. How many of you know that we don't have to muster up faith? The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In other words, what we're going to do is we're going to look in the word And when we hear the word, when we hear of God's promises, when we hear of his faithfulness, it builds our faith so that then we can express faith to walk in this upside down kingdom. Are you with me? That just makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So here's what I want to do. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Kings. We're going to go to the Old Testament. And I want to show you, I want to show you a story in the Old Testament, in the book of First Kings, and we're gonna we're gonna read this entire thing. It's 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 a pretty significant length of of scripture. But faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word. It doesn't come by hearing Jody's words. It comes by hearing the word of God. So let's read this together. So we're in First Kings, the uh, chapter seventeen, and let's begin reading. It says, "Then the Lord said to Elijah." Go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. See, so he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please bring me a little water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called her and said, Bring me a bite of bread too. But she answered, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then me and my son will die. That sounds like a good day. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. So she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers just as the Lord had promised through Elijah the word of the Lord that's for all you Catholics out there right so this is what the Bible says interesting story the uh, the land is actually in drought and there's a famine going on there's no crops growing and everybody's in dire straits and and um, so let's approach this first through the paradigm of the prophet Elijah So God says to Elijah, I want want you to be provided for. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Zarephath. And um, there I have prepared a widow to take care of you. Now, I'm sure at that moment, a question mark popped up in Elijah's mind. Because widows are not known for taking care of people. Widows are known for being taken care of. And so he probably thought this doesn't sound right. And then he walked in the city and he saw the person who was who was who was, has been uh, given the responsibility to provide for him. How many of you know he probably wasn't really excited about the future? This, this poor person is the one that you've, 
that you've called to, to provide for me. But see, here's the trick. Elijah understood that God is faithful in his provision and he would bring water out of a rock. He would bring a stream through a desert. He would move whatever because God has, has promised to provide for him. God has promised to provide for me and you and it doesn't, care what, it doesn't matter what the stock market's doing, what the interest rates are. It doesn't matter. We have a promise of provision. But it may not look like you think it ought to look. It just looked kind of funky here. This didn't look great. Now let's look about it, look at it through, through the eyes of this widow. The man of God shows up and says, hey, guess what? I've been sent by God so that you can provide for me. And she's probably like, there's one of them television preachers right there. I don't know if Elijah had the, the tele-evangelist hair and the caps. I don't know if that's how he looked. That's funny. I don't care who you are. I was probably like, oh, here we go. Here's the man of God, <laughs> right? But he shows up there. And, um, and again, I, you know, sometimes it, it feels like, and when we come to churches and we talk about generosity and we talk about things like this, if we're not careful, because if we only function by how the systems of this world work, we think, oh, they're here to take from me. Listen, Elijah was not there to take from her. What she didn't know was that her very provision, her provision through the tough times, and not just her, but for her entire family, her provision was there in the form of that challenge. She could either, see what she said was right, she just had a little handful of, of flour and just a little bit of oil, and she could have had that day she had already planned. She had planned that glorious day when she and her son cooked this little dry piece of bread eat it and meet their final end. She could have had that day or she could choose to sow into the kingdom of God the little bit of resources that she had. What she didn't understand or apparently she did is that God's provision was waiting on the other side of her faithfulness, of her obedience, even though it didn't make sense. And what am I saying to you today? I'm saying this. I don't know what situation you're in right now, but I want to tell you, you serve a faithful God. And if you're his child, he has provision for you. But if you're only looking at it through the, the systems of this world, then what he calls you to do may not make sense. He may challenge you, but let me tell you, let me tell you church, your provision is on the other side of your obedience. A couple of years ago, during the COVID um, epidemic. I was, um, I, I came across this video on the internet and how many of you know there's a, for some reason there's a, a large group of people out there today who feel like their calling in the kingdom is to make videos that criticize other ministers and pastors and we just tear each other down. There's, if you're looking for that, it's out there, I promise you. And I, and I came across this video and it was this pastor and he was, um, he was trying to shame Pastor Robert Morris from Grapevine, Texas. You know, Robert Morris with Gateway Church in Grapevine, Texas. And, and he, this, this guy was just couldn't believe that in the middle of the, the pandemic, when people were, were suffering and being challenged financially, this pastor couldn't believe that Robert Morris told his people to tithe. I, I watched the video, Pastor Robert Moore stood up and said, listen, in these tough times, make sure that you're tithing. Now, again, if you've got the wrong mindset, then you sit there and think, there's the televangelist. That's the guy wanting to come and take. Listen, Pastor Robert Morris, he, he didn't need their tithes. Pastor Robert Morris is doing fine, right? Gateway Church is doing fine. They didn't need his ties. What he was asking them to do was not about him. It was about them. Listen, there's two ways you can approach this. You can attach your, your finances to the world's economy and the world system. And some of you are really skilled at your job and, and you can, you're really good at making money. And some of you will do just fine like that. 
But listen, there's another way that doesn't depend on your skill set, your smartness, your talent, or anything. It's that you don't attach your finances to the, to the kingdoms of this world. You attach your finances to the kingdom of God. And when you do things God's way, God provides. So I stand here before you. I, I don't know Pastor Robert personally. I know his church, and I, I've got some friends on staff there with him. I believe in his church. What he was saying to those people was not, he wasn't trying to take from them. It was the heart of a pastor saying, if you'll do this God's way, there will always be flour in the barrel. There will always be oil in the jug. You'll make it through the tough times. You'll make it through the times that seem impossible because God will provide for you if you will flow with the economy of heaven. That's what he was saying. And that's what I'm saying to you today. I'm just encouraging you to be generous to walk with a spirit of generosity, even if you have a little. Let me tell you, especially if you have a little, sow it into the kingdom of God because here's, here's God's plan for your provision. Get your pencils out because this is gonna, you're gonna need this. Here's God's plan for your provision. You ready? God has put something in your hand. It may not be much, but God has put something in your hand. He's given you gifts and talents. That's something. He's given you resources. He's given you food. He's given you money. He's given you something. There is something. And look down at your hand and say, there's something in my hand. There's something that you were to give. And his plan is that he, we would take what he's given to us and that we would sow them into his kingdom. That we, would, that we would be generous in the same way that he was generous. Listen, God only had one son, but he gave that one son. And because of sowing his one son, he has reaped millions of sons. We are the harvest of the planting of his one son. What's in your hand? What's in your hand to sow? Do we approach it with, uh, I've just got this little bit. Listen, this, this widow had every reason in the world, every right in the world to claim, I don't have much. But what she did was she sowed it into the kingdom. We see in Jesus' ministry, there's thousands of people following Jesus, listening to him. Turns to a little boy who's just got a little bitty lunch, and he takes the kid's lunch. Come on, Jesus. He's like the bully on the playground. He took his lunch. But what did he do? That little boy sowed his lunch into the kingdom, and instead of him just eating, thousands ate from what he sowed. Are you with me this morning? I'm not here to take up an offering. You can take a breath. I'm just encouraging you. The kingdom works different than the rest of the world. It's going to take faith. But if we look in the word, we see what he will do. We, he describes his faithfulness. And, you know, the Bible tells us, I mentioned tithing a minute ago. Um, you know, tithing, especially today, just seems like, what, you want me to do what? You want me to give 10% of my income to the church? What? Right? Well, that's exactly where Israel found themselves. At the end of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, we see that God says to Israel, he says, hey, I want you to know you've been robbing me. And they go, what? How have we been robbing you? And he actually says, I've been robbing you by the tithes, or you've been robbing me by tithes and offerings you haven't been tithing. And so here's what God goes on to say. Now, follow me on this. Imagine you're sitting in this room. God says to them, here's what I want you to do. I want you to try me on this. I want you to test me on this. It's one of the only times in the Bible when God said, test me. And he said, test me. He said, if you'll tithe, test me, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to open up the windows of heaven over your life. I don't know about you, but windows of heaven sounds like a good thing. And he said, not only am I going to open the windows, I'm going to pour out a blessing on you so much that you won't even be able to contain it. Anybody in the room up for that? He said, not only will I do that, because remember they were an agricultural society, so they're, they're into farming and stuff. He said, not only am I going to pour out the windows of heaven, open the windows and pour out a blessing on you. He said, I'm actually going to keep the insects that would come and destroy your crops. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let them show up. The diseases that would, that would, that would come on your, your livestock, not going to be there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be watching over them. I don't know how many of you have crops in the field right now. 
There's probably not many farmers in the room. Is that's my point? All right? But listen, whatever that looks like in your life, God is still able to protect you from the devourer. And so he said, listen, I'm, I'll protect you if you'll tithe, if you'll try me on this. I'm going to open the winds of heaven. I'm going I'm to keep, keep protection over your, your finances. And not only that, I'm going to do it so well that your neighbors are going to look at you. And I love this word. He used this word. He said, your land, what, your home, your, it's going to be delightful. Your neighbors are going to look at you and go, that's delightful. Anybody want to sign up for that? Listen, that's not taking. That's God blessing you. I'm talking about aligning ourselves with, with how the economy of heaven works. In the book of Luke, Jesus, as he was ministering, he was talking about the subject of giving, and it really didn't, it wasn't just, it wasn't just about money, it was about whatever you give. And, and here's the promise he gave in Luke chapter 6. He said, if you'll give, I'll give back to you. He said, give and it shall be given. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together. In other words, what's given back to you, like picture a box. So I'm going to give you a box of stuff that you're actually going to have to shake it and press in it and push it in, and it's still going to be overflowing. He said, if you'll give, I'll give back to you in that way. In other words, whatever you give that's coming back to you in multiplied form. He said, he said, give. And not only did, did he say that, he went on to say, listen, the same measure with which you give is, is how much is coming back. So if you give a little, that little will be multiplied. But if you give a lot, that lot will be multiplied. Goes on to say in the book of 2 Corinthians that, that when a farmer goes to plant, if he'll plant bountifully, then he reaps a bountiful harvest. Listen, if you got, if you got a dozen kernels of corn in your hand, you say, I've, I've, I've got to have a meal. I'm going to eat 10 of these, but I'm only going to plant two of them. So you plant two of them. Guess what grows? Two corn plants and the harvest off of two corn plants. But if you'll plant all 12, you'll have 12 corn plants and the harvest. Everybody with me? So here's what I'm saying. God has set up a way for you to, to, to walk in his economy and for your provision to be tied to heaven. And I tell you what, with all the instability in the world today, I really don't want my provision tied up to the, to the systems of this world. When I can have my provision tied to the kingdom of heaven that will never be shaken, that will never go bankrupt, that will, you understand? And so what he's saying is God has given us a way. He's called us to be generous. He's called us to reflect his generosity by the way that we sow into the people around us, into the world around us. But not only has he given us that responsibility, what he said is if you do that, there are blessings that will come back to you. So if you engage with my kingdom, you'll be, you'll be the winner in the whole situation. God's provision is tied to your obedience and to the way his economy works. So as we're approaching this holiday season, you know, this is a season of giving and no doubt you've already been involved in some giving. We know that there's, there's lots of great things to give to in our community and I, whatever you have done in the way of giving, congratulations, keep it up, right? This is a time to give. We're approaching 2023. 20, it's a new year. It's, we're kind of getting ready. Here's what I want to do. I, I know as a staff, as a church, what I want to do is I want to approach 2023 with a generous spirit. Say, so Lord, I'm ready, I'm ready to learn how to walk in generosity, to reflect your goodness, and then whatever it brings back to me would just be that much more. So I encourage you to have a generous spirit in the future. You know, I said last week that, um, that in my upbringing, somehow, I mean, I was, I was raised in a good middle-class family. You know, we weren't poor. We didn't struggle. If you listen to my brother, he'll tell you some stories that make it sound like we were poor. But because um, I think I've shared with you, I had the knockoff Nikes, you know, and uh, all those kind of things. Listen, either have Nikes or don't have Nikes. Don't have the knockoff Nikes. I, I can just tell you that, right? And, uh, but, but I grew up with really a lack mentality. I really struggled with the lack mentality. I don't know if that, does anybody register with that? Know what I mean with that? It's like, there's just always not enough. There's just, you gotta, 
And, uh, and so part of, my, part of my journey with God is that I felt God saying, Jody, I need to grow you out of that. I need, I need to grow you out of a lack mentality into an abundance mentality. Is, is any of this landing with you guys here this morning? As a part of my journey, I'll tell you something that happened. Um, we were, um, Lori and I and some others here from the church were in, in another state at a conference at a big church. It was a, a big church that was nationally known and uh, really doing great things in the kingdom of God back then. They're really kind of trendsetters. And so in the church world, a lot, of, a lot of pastors and stuff were going and kind of seeing what they're doing and learning from them. So we went to this conference of this church and they had just built a brand new building. And so we walk into this auditorium and it's a monstrosity. You know, I'm from Sulphur. I mean, this thing could have swallowed this room whole, you know. Um, and so we go to this conference and and of course, everything's big. Now, the heart of the pastor and the heart of the staff there was golden. I'm not, it wasn't, they weren't trying to prove how good they were. They were just serving God with excellence. It was, it just had that spirit about it. And this, this room, you know, I walk in, I'm like, this is overwhelming. I don't even know how to think like this. And um, so we sat through that conference at that church. And one thing I noticed is that we were sitting in temporary chairs. The, the, the auditorium was built, but the chairs were temporary and, and about the last uh, service of the conference, the pastor got up and said, uh, we're actually raising money right now to buy the chairs. Hey, they were buying the movie theater chairs. Come on, Jesus. <laughs> Not the bistro chairs. Yeah, we don't need the, we don't need you doing that, right? But the movie theater chairs, you know, they were going to put that in the auditorium. And the pastor got up and, and said, hey, you've come here. Um, hopefully we've blessed you. Just wanted to let you know we're raising money for these seats if you want to be a part of it. It wasn't a hard push. It wasn't an arm twist. It was none of that. And as soon as he said that, I felt the Lord say to me, you and Laurie need to be a part of that. And, and when, it, when, I, when I felt this from the Lord, I thought, why do these people in this big old building and all, why do they need Jody LaFleur's money? I mean, like I'm in my mid twenties. Uh, we're not we're not doing well financially, you know. I mean, we're we're making it, but we're not we're not swimming in money. And I'm thinking, why in the world? And what I what I felt from the Lord was, if you want to learn to think with bigger vision, then you need to sow into bigger vision. You need to let me expand your thinking by by sowing into something like this. And so we made up our mind. And uh, we didn't have a checkbook with us, and you couldn't give online back then. And so when we got home. Laura and I got together. I think, I can't remember, I think we bought two seats, just one for each of us. So in that building right now, there's a Jody and Laurie memorial seats in that building right now in Tulsa, Oklahoma. There's, there's a, they're in there. I, when I get home, I, you know, we wrote a check for it. And then and instead of just mailing the check, I wrote a letter to whom it may concern. And, and really, all I was doing in this letter, I really did, and I just said, hey, this really has nothing to do with you, whoever's reading this letter. Has it, this is between me and God. And my God told me, if I want to learn to think bigger, I need to sow into some bigger soil. So this is me by faith sowing into this. And, and my prayer is through, through this. This is a movement toward expansion. And I typed this letter and, and you know, just kind of gave him a whole history and, uh, and sent it off. And, you know, there it goes. I don't know if those seats have my name on it or not. I don't know. <laughs> but here's what happened. About a week later, I got a note from that pastor, a handwritten note from that pastor. And he said, Jody, I just want you to understand that I too grew up with lack thinking. God had to do this kind of work on the inside of me. So thank you for your gift. And I'm believing that God's going to expand you through sowing into this. I'm for you. You're going to make it. Let's go. Yeah. It was beautiful, right? It was something that Laurie and I did, and I, I believe it made a difference in our life. You know, there was a time uh, in our life, and this was, again, early in our marriage. Um, we had this car, and it was, a, it was a great little car. It was a little four-door four sedan. It was a great little family car. Um, I think back then we just had the boys. We had our two boys, and so all four of us could fit in this car, but she was pregnant with Gracie, and so we were about to be five, and so that car wasn't going to work anymore, so we started thinking about a new car, but the car we had was paid off, 
And so when we go to shop in a new car, we hear the Lord, I heard the Lord say to me, I want you to give that car away. Uh, excuse me, Lord. Can you say that in my good ear? All right. So of course I go home and like, you know, I'm, I'm going to run it by Laurie. And, uh, and if she says no, I'll know God said, I, I miss her, right? <laughs> of course, when you have a godly woman, maybe I think God wants to give the car. Okay, where do we sign? You know, where do we do? Yeah. And so we felt the Lord say, Jody, you know, Lori, let's sew this car. And so there was a lady here in the church who we knew needed a car miracle. And so let's, God wanted to give her a car mirror. He wanted to show his goodness to this woman, show his generosity to this woman. He wanted to show his love. So he tapped me and Laurie on the shoulder. And we had the blessing and the privilege of being the hands and feet of our God to express generosity and hand a paid off car to this woman who was in tears and intensely blessed by the gift we sowed into, into her life. How about the generosity of God? Fast forward several years our family, we were serving in Belize at the time. We were missionaries in Belize, and we'd been down there for a year. And before we left, of course, we had sold all our vehicles. We didn't own a vehicle because we didn't need one in the States that we were living in Belize. When we moved back from Belize, it's time to get your life back together. We need a car. So we moved back. How are we going to get a car? We weren't here 48 hours, and somebody knocked on the door. Hey, God told me to give you a car. The car we sowed brought another car in return. I'm talking about the economy of the kingdom. So you can look at this and say, well, you know, here's the preacher man. Here's the televangelist. I don't have that televangelist hair. <laughs> it's not what this is. Tell me, yeah. let me know you, you trust my heart, right? It's not what this is. <laughs> this is about you tapping into the economy of heaven. So I encourage you, church, pray, ask God to develop a spirit of generosity on the inside of you, especially if you're like me and you came from a place of lack where everything you saw was lack. If you're that widow in here this morning, I just got a little bit, then pray and ask God where to sow your little bit. I just got a little bit of time. Where can you sow your time? I've just got a, a little bit of energy. Where can you sow your energy? I've just got a little bit of resources. Where can you sow your resources? God's got a plan. And if you will engage in his economy, he'll make sure that you're always provided for. So we've been able to bless Godding Light Ministry. You guys have been there and, and provided for that. I mentioned last week that we are in, we're, this is the last week of raising money for the uh, India Orphanage, our India Christmas giving. Last week, uh, we introduced this. I talk, told you about India. You can actually look back on last week's message and see all the details of the orphanage we have in India. But uh, I put the call out last week, and in just in one little call, we raised $5,400 in here last week for the, come on now orphans in India, right? $5,400. That was great. We've got this, we can, we're still collecting for that. So if you're, if you're a person sitting in here and saying, this message has meant something to me, I need to find a place to sow. Listen, sow toward India. Not a, not a dime of that stays in the U.S. It's all going to bless orphans in India and it's our orphanage. It's not some out there, right? So if God's speaking to you, you can still sow into that today. But if not, if, if that's not what you need to do, listen, find somewhere, somewhere to be generous. As, as Jade and the team were leading us in worship, I was thinking, oh, how about a spirit of generosity in worship? Or I don't just give God table full, table, tablespoonfuls, but I, like the woman with the alabaster jar, I just empty it out on God generous with our worship, generous with our friendship, generous with our love, generous with sharing the gospel, generous in serving in the church. I don't show up at church and just receive, but I'm here to, to, to be a part and engage and pull weight and, and serve. I'm talking about a spirit of generosity. Generosity.